Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Obstetric cholestasis, also known as intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, is a liver condition that occurs in late pregnancy. This condition triggers intense itching in pregnancy without rash. So apparently it's just an itch, but if left untreated, it can cause significant morbidity of mother and serious complication in the fetus and in the newborn. So hello and welcome to our YouTube channel obstetric and gynecology i would like you to subscribe our channel for the latest updates new guidelines and recommendations in the field of obstetric and gynecology and if you want me to make a specific video related to any topic of obstetric and gynecology you can write in the comment section so coming to our main topic the latest 2022 RCUG guideline about obstetric cholestasis. Basically, I will discuss the key points and key recommendations of this guideline and especially I will highlight the similarities and differences between this and the previous guideline. But the basic management is almost the same as we studied in the previous guideline. So I would suggest that you shouldn't uh, underestimate the previous version of this guideline as well. So after watching this uh, video, click the link in the description or in the i button in the right upper corner to study the previous edition of this guideline as well. So let us start from the key recommendations from this guideline. Uh, the previous uh, 2011 obstetric cholestasis guideline stated that obstetric cholestasis is diagnosed when otherwise unexplained pruritus occurs in pregnancy and abnormal liver function tests um, and or raised bile acids occurs in the pregnant woman and both resolve after delivery. So this was a definition given in the previous guideline. So about bile acid, it said that and or raised bile acid and LFTs was given given more importance that raised LFT uh, help us in diagnosis. But the latest uh, 2022 obstetric cholestasis guideline says that the diagnosis of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy should be considered in pregnant women who have itching in the skin of normal appearance and raised peak random total bile acid concentration of 19 micromole per liter or more. Okay, so bile acid concentration should be checked when a woman comes with itching in pregnancy. About the laboratory investigation, the latest 2022 guideline about obstetric cholestasis says that additional laboratory and or imaging investigations are not recommended unless itch is associated with atypical clinical symptoms or the presence of relevant comorbidities or in a early onset severe intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. So consider additional postnatal investigations in the woman in whom the resolution of abnormal liver function test is delayed or does not occur. Now the role of hepatologist is specifically mentioned in this guideline and it says that consider discussing the care of women with severe or very early or atypical presentation of what appears to be intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy with hepatologist. But the previous guideline didn't mention the significance of discussion with hepatologist in case of obstetric cholestasis. Next, in the previous guideline, it was written that the uh, suggested model for follow-up of women with obstetric cholestasis was to check LFT at uh, six weeks after delivery uh, and an appointment at eight weeks. Um, I think most, uh, this is also written in the talk article as well, the talk article about the obstetric cholestasis. Uh, and the latest 2022 guideline about obstetric cholestasis says that uh, we need to confirm the diagnosis of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy in the uh, postnatal period at least four weeks after birth. So previously LFTs uh, was needed to be checked at six weeks. Now this guideline says that check it at least um, four weeks after birth and um, uh, in this um, test we need to check 
whether LFTs are coming to normal, including the bile acids. And also we have to check that whether there is any resolution of itching or not. About the risk of stillbirth in the previous guideline, it was written that in a hospital setting, uh, the current additional risk of stillbirth in obstetric cholestasis above that of the general population has not been determined, but is likely to be small. The latest 2022 RCG guideline clearly explains the risk and states that the risk of stillbirth only increases above population rate once the serum bile acid concentration is 100 micromole per liter or above. In the women with peak bile acids of 19 to 39 micromole per liter, means mild ICP and no risk factors, advise them that the risk of stillbirth is similar to that of background risk. And we need to consider the option of planned birth by 40 weeks of gestation or ongoing antenatal care according to the national guideline. But what happens in case of the moderate ICP? In the woman with a peak bile acid of 40 to 99 micromole per liter and no other risk factor advise them that the known risk of stillbirth is similar to the background risk until 38 to 39 weeks of gestation. I mean to say that we need to plan the birth at 38 to 39 weeks of gestation. And in the woman with a bile acid of 100 micromole per liter or above means severe ICP advise them the risk of stillbirth is higher than the background risk. And we need to consider the planned birth at 35 to 36 weeks of gestation. A comparative study done in the previous guideline concluded that there was no much difference between a group of singleton and twin pregnancy regarding the risk of stillbirth and the latest 2022 RCUG guidelines states that we need to advise women with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy and a twin pregnancy that the risk of stillbirth is higher compared with that of twin pregnancy without ICP. So here is a twin birth with the obstetric cholestasis is shown in the figure. Both previous and the latest guideline also say that clinicians should be aware that the fetal ultrasound and CTG, the cardiotocography, do not predict or prevent the stillbirth in ICP. Advise the woman with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy to monitor fetal moments and present for immediate assessment at their local maternity if they have any concern. Okay, so there is the importance of fetal movement assessment by the mother. The fetal movements are monitored by the mother on fetal kick count chart. Now, how frequently should LFTs be done in patients with obstetric cholestasis? The previous guideline said that once obstetric cholestasis is diagnosed, it is reasonable to measure LFTs weekly until delivery. And it said that postnatal LFTs should be deferred for at least 10 days. But the latest guideline states that for women with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, consider repeating LFTs and bile acid after one week's and then determine frequency on the individual basis. And postnatally, LFTs should be checked after four weeks. So see the difference. Previously, before delivery, every week until delivery, and now confirm, reconfirm it after one week and then determine frequency on individual basis. Previously, postnatally uh, after 10 days and now postnatally after four weeks. Next, the previous guidelines uh, didn't mention the association of other comorbidities along with the obstetric cholestasis. But the latest 2022 guideline states that we need to advise women with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy that the presence of risk factors or comorbidities such as uh, gestational diabetes and or preeclampsia and or multifetal pregnancy appear to increase the risk of stillbirth and may influence 
the decision making around the timing of planned birth next is about the specific treatment both previous and latest guidelines state that there are no treatments that can improve pregnancy outcome okay so for pregnancy outcome we do not have any specific treatment or therapy neither we have any treatment to lower the raised bile acid concentration and the treatments which are given to the women for improvement of maternal aging or of limited benefits so what about ursodi oxycholic acid which is commonly prescribed in our setups so regarding the ursodi oxycholic acid previous guideline mentioned that women should be informed of the lack of robust data concerning protection against the stillbirth and safety to the fetus or neonate and the latest 2022 rcg guideline about intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy states that do not routinely offer urso deoxycholic acid for the purpose of reducing adverse perinatal outcome in women with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy next the antihistamine consider antihistamine agents such as chlorpheniramine particularly at night although the effectiveness of this treatment is uncertain in women with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy consider topical emollients such as aquas cream with or without menthol added to ameliorate the skin symptoms consider maternal uh, vitamin k treatments only if there appears to be reduced absorption of dietary fats okay like for for instance in the presence of steatorrhea when there is reduced absorption of fat or there is uh, another condition when we check the coagulation profile of the patient and we find the abnormal prothrombin time in our coagulation profile test result then we can consider vitamin k now it's very important to note that not the usual type of vitamin k is prescribed this should be water soluble vitamin k formulation such as menadiol so sodium phosphate at the dose of 10 mg daily now why specifically this water soluble vitamin k is given that's a very important question the answer is that it's because the liver is already compromised in intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy so fat soluble vitamin k will not be absorbed properly this is something i'm telling you after searching it it's not written in the guideline but that's the logic behind the what soluble vitamin k now this latest guideline gives us the classification of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy based upon the bile acid concentration this classification was not given in the previous guideline okay so in general uh, gestational pruritus means pregnancy with a itching but not intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy uh, the itching and peak bile acid concentration is less than 19 micromol per liter and as i said earlier in the definition of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy that the bile acid concentration should be more than 19 micromol so from 19 micromol per liter the intrahepatic cholestasis diagnosis starts so what happens in the mild intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy itching and raised peak bile acid concentration of 19 to 39 micromol per liter but when the itching and raised peak bile acid concentration lies in the range of 40 to 99 micromol per liter you better label the patient suffering from moderate intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy now when would we say that this patient has now got the severe intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy that is when she suffers from itching along with a peak bile acid concentration of more than 100 micromol per liter so remember all these values in order to clearly label the patient according to appropriate classification system defined by rcg now coming to the complications of obstetric cholestasis this latest rcg guideline talks about maternal morbidity associated with obstetric cholestasis and it states that 
we need to advise the woman with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy that the predominant symptom is itching. This can be severe, may fluctuate or may markedly affect the sleep. Discuss with the woman with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy that she may have a higher chance of developing preeclampsia or gestational diabetes. They should have blood pressure and urine monitoring and testing for gestational diabetes according to the national guidance. Now, what are the possible maternal complications? I would uh, tell you in list. Those are maternal pruritus, sleep deprivation, worsening LFTs, risk associated with induction of the labor, uh, increased risk of operative vaginal delivery, increased risk of cesarean section, and how much is an increased risk from 10% to 36% the risk increases because of obstetric cholestasis. And the risk of PPH, the postpartum hemorrhage also increases from 2 to 22% in such women. Now, the perinatal morbidity has also been explained by the latest RCOG guideline associated with uh, obstetric cholestasis. So it says that advise the woman with moderate or severe intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy that they have a higher chance of both spontaneous and iatrogenic preterm births. Okay, and so what are the other possible risks? The meconium passage, fetal distress, and increased uh, NICU admissions of that uh, newborn baby. Next, the latest um, RCG guideline also says that advise the woman with moderate and severe intrahepatic of, uh, cholestasis of pregnancy that they have an increased chance of having meconium stain amniotic fluid during labor and birth. Okay, so there is increased chance of meconium aspiration syndrome in them as well. And we need to advise with a moderate and severe intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy that their baby is more likely to receive neonatal care in an ICU. Now, timing of the birth in obstetric cholestasis has also been explained in the latest RCG guideline. And it says that consider the option of planned birth by 40 weeks of gestation or ongoing antenatal care according to the national guidance in women with a mild ICP like uh, we have uh, bile acid of 19 to 39 micromole and no other risk factor advice a woman at, uh, that the stillbirth is similar to that of background risk. Okay, so that in the mild ICP, the bile acid concentration of 19 to 39 as I have told you, there, uh, there is a minimal risk of the stillbirth and uh, we can uh, um, plan the birth uh, by 40 weeks. So this uh, timing of the birth is also different from the previous guideline. The latest guideline clearly says the timing of the birth according to the uh, the classification of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy which has been done according to the bile acid levels. And in the moderate group of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, when we have a bile acid level of 40 to 99 micromole per liter and no other risk factors, we need to advise them that the overall risk of the stillbirth is similar to that uh, background uh, risk until 38 to 39 weeks of gestation. Okay, so we do not have to go beyond 38 to 39 weeks of gestation. At 39 weeks of gestation, we have to plan delivery. So what about the woman in whom we have severe intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy means the, the bile acid level in them is 100 micromole um, per liter or above. We need to advise them that the risk of stillbirth is higher than the background risk. Okay, so we need to consider the delivery uh, at about 35 to 36 weeks of gestation. Do not go beyond 36 weeks of gestation in the woman with the bile acid level of 100 micromole per liter or more. And, and then uh, we have to consider uh, the women's having certain comorbidities. We need to give them special consideration like um, the RCG guideline says that advise the woman um, that the presence of comorbidities such as gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, multifetal pregnancy appear to increase the risk of stillbirth and may influence the decision making around the timing um, of birth. Okay, so we have to see the patient um, 
as a whole looking at each and every comorbidities next come the mood of the bird okay advise the woman that intrahepatic cholestasis pregnancy in itself does not impact the choice around the mood of the bird this is what uh, written in the rcg guideline about icp and uh, that these dcn should be based on the usual obstetric practice of that woman means uh, whether we uh, deliver the uh, baby by normal vaginal delivery or cesarean section that dcn is not affected by the diagnosis of obstetric cholestasis means if there is no contraindication to vaginal birth we can go for vaginal birth but induction at appropriate time now coming to the last point the contraception choice advise the woman that intrahepatic cholestasis pregnancy uh, itself does not influence their choice of contraception or hormone replacement therapy for a woman with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy and previous cholestasis secondary to combined hormonal estrogen Estrogen containing contraception advise them to use progesterone only non-hormonal method. Progesterone only pills or non-hormonal method means only those women who had ICP secondary to the uh, combined hormonal pills. We have to advise non-hormonal. methods or progesterone only methods and uh, in the woman with the previous icp requesting hrd consider offering it uh, if there are no other contraindication to the use of hrd okay thank you so much that was all about the latest guideline of uh, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy for the previous guideline you can go to the i button or the link given in the description and write in the comments how was this video and also write in the comments the topic on which you would like me to make specific video okay thank you so much for your